So Liz, I, I wanted to start off with you want to give a little bit of background of what r and Strategic is and how you kind of started in your path, like, just like we did for the others, and, and then you know, from So r and Strategic is a marketing agency completely focused on sustainability. So a little bit of background on how we got there. I used to be a design agency that worked with and So we take any client and we do great work for them, especially it just completely exhausted me. Why am I doing this work every day? I love the business. I've kind of like lost this initial excitement of being entrepreneurs. It's all working now, my job kind of sucks. So I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I love to hang out business partner and just like start a food business. So totally other topic. And we're both like, we're never, ever, ever doing marketing again. So about three months in, we were like, we're gonna need a lot of money. Like there's gonna be a lot of cash needed. We're like, how do we do some free cash? And we're like, marketing. <laughs> So the next day we got a great phone call from Algae Contract and the rest kind of misery, it just really stuck with us. So our team's growing, I would think it's much more passionate to work. So uh, eco-marketing or sustainability um, marketing is a really interesting area because um, it's very it's clear that purpose-driven marketing and just purpose-driven business in general, in my opinion, I think it's just the future of all business. We have a fancy name for social entrepreneurship or our corporate social responsibility, depending on what side of the spectrum the business is on. Um, I'm curious to see kind of what your view of the value of purpose for our business and what role you think it plays um, in, in with your clients and then for entrepreneurs. Like, how does social add value to the businesses you work with? I think it adds huge value to internally and externally. Because from a team perspective, you get all these pockets when you're recruiting. So you get people really passionate about what you're passionate about, and you're just kind of going to bring energy kind of things, right? And they really hang out longer, and they like to work more. Like, everyone has the reason to wake up in the morning. And then when you meet your clients, and you're also fighting for the same cause as you are, it also helps you with your sales cycles, your relationships with them are so much stronger because you're all fighting. So it kind of creates like a common purpose in a common ground. Um, so with that in mind, so one of the big things that I always hear, whether it's a big Fortune 500 company or whether it's a startup, when they are focused on purpose and and, and sustainability, um, one of the big things I, I always hear is uh, their priority to communicate their impact story. And obviously that's what your business are focused a lot on. So do you want to give share some tips to, to, to us tonight on how do you effectively communicate your impact story? What works or what doesn't work? Yeah, I think it's an interesting topic these days, especially when we're kind of going through this phase of greenwashing. Every single business is now a tribe of green. So some customers come to us with not a completely circular, sustainable solution, but they're looking to be better so you can start to look at how they're going to achieve these goals over time and start talking about what they're so I think that's definitely, if you've got things you're doing, you're great to talk about as well, but the things you're working towards in the company you want to become, it's great to publicize as well, and it keeps you accountable. Do you have any creative um, marketing you know, projects or can you give some, an example of someone who's done communicating their brand and that's story very well? That's a great question. So we, we do a lot of clean tech startups with their stories and communication. So we also do a lot of work with the government and we help them bring projects to life. So for example, we worked with a not-for-profit locally, the Department of Energy, and we worked on getting solar out of the public. So we had to look at all different populations and areas and see what their needs were and the level of understanding and help educate them. And we built a tool for the public to go on and figure out you know, how do I put solar panels in my home? There's like a hundred and five questions, so we help them calculate the cost of your home and what that process would be like to help them convert into to nuclear energy. Yeah. And then um, from your own perspective, uh, so one of the uh, one of the quotes that Sandra Queen and most of the mentors always said is uh, mistake is just another word for experience. So I always like to ask young entrepreneurs. Um, what is their, what is the standard experience that they've had? So in your journey, uh, you started, you've gone through the iterations of your business, 
this. Could you share with the, the, us uh, an experience that you had and how you, how that's changed your new your approach to your new business? Definitely, I think kind of mistakes or experiences is early on. I think I came to an entrepreneur really young, and I thought I had to sort of know what I was doing all the time. And through that time, I think the top pieces of information or like advice mentors gave me really shaped this business and how because I started to listen. And I look back and I see young people asking for advice, and I think it's just so important to be honest about where you're at because you will get the most of everyone around you and make better decisions. So, for example, a lot of people told me to focus on a niche with my first agency. Two years in, I also realized that after being told that a few times, and now I just know that it's actually implementing that, so it's pretty cool. I, I, like, I always like to say that, in all honesty, I find that sometimes even if someone tells you there's a dead end, you have to walk there and see the dead end before, like, as much as, like, mentorship kind of, like, I always envision, like, mentorship kind of like you're lost in a forest, and mentors could be, like, your compass, be like, hey, don't go that way, we've been there, it's, it's a dead end, it's a like, don't go there, and you may just be really defined, be like, no, I really think this is the way. And you will go there and find like, oh, you're right. <laughs> and then you go back. Like, but sometimes I think you, you need to learn from experience. But it is, I think, yeah, this thing more to mentors. They probably know what they are too. <laughs> um, so looking at it, kind of where you're at right now, what is the challenge that you're, that you're facing? I appreciate that there's different stages of businesses, and like you said, when you pivot and things, there's different experiences. So now that you're at the stage where you found your niche and, and you kind of reignited that passion within your business, what's what's that next step for you? Where's the what's that next challenge that uh, something new that you're facing now that maybe you haven't in, in the past? So right now that we're we're at two and a half robots now, so now we're going to really study, so we're looking for our next phase and how to grow a bigger electric company out of this while still retaining all of our core values and keeping our services amazing because we know that can slip pretty quick if you grow it too fast. So those are kind of the upcoming challenges we have and also keeping an eye on the ball of what services we need to be offering as everything changes around us. One thing that you didn't touch on too much that I want to maybe just focus a little bit more on is it seems like it has your, your narrative is kind of, you had an agency, and then you pivoted and focused on a niche, and it, it seems a little bit smooth, superficially, because I know it's not, but I, from, from, from hearing the story, it's kind of like, okay, so I pivoted, then we have a successful business, and we're here with all these clients. Can you maybe share a little bit more in terms of, like, what is your approach to getting those clients? How do you, how do you get that startup going? Like, I appreciate you'll have relationships in your old business, but for someone who's starting out, oftentimes I find it's not the gap of the idea. Like most entrepreneurs, they can figure out their idea and maybe even get some of them who are a little bit, uh, have a little more initiative, can get an initial team or buy in. But how do you grow, how do you give it lead, right? Like how do you get that lead generation and establish yourself? Do you have any advice? I know if, even if you didn't encounter that in your second round, even in your first round, do you have any advice on? Take that step. Yeah, definitely. So it, it definitely was a smooth transition, but I just wanted to match up all of my story there. I'm actually still filing the paperwork to close my first business this week, so things are right on. Um, so I think that comes back to understanding where you put your energy in and really learning from your experience. Yeah, but, but do you have any like advice on how you get your clients, how you kind of start to grow that business? like? Um, I think that's a key area a lot of people struggle mm -hmm. with, right? Is that lead generation and business development piece. And that's where I think even with the, the courage of taking initiative or risk and all that things, that comes into play, right? And where do we find the clients? How do we get the credibility to get those clients? So I appreciate every process is different, but in your experience, what worked for you? Yeah, definitely. So my previous business, I think sales was more difficult for me. Like it was something I could learn. I was buying books. I was asking around. How to do sales, you know, I'm designing that right. So it's pretty intimidating to just pick up the phone and call somebody. So I definitely did some groundwork and made the mistakes and went through the challenges that time. And I did have a mentor advise me that I should find somebody really strong in strategy and sales to become my partner. And 
also one of those things that put the back of my head for a bit. And I thought with my business partner now, who is a strategist and an amazing salesperson. So she's been great at skyrocketing the sales department. Where we were in each business and we really got to prove your ground in something like sustainability. Our first year definitely was putting in a lot of work, but proving what we could do and doing a lot of extra projects to just give people examples. And you know, like sometimes it's just reaching out and saying, Hey, we want to do this project with you, and we're going to start working on it. And eventually, they turn into your client as your first view. So you have to really put up all the pressure first, but then things start to turn around for you once you've made your ground in that niche. That's interesting because I have found in, in uh, my experience in selling my college too with this whole thing like that sometimes you have to do the odd pro bono project or volunteer initiative or something to your point where you take the initiative and it's not. It's not kind of coming to the market and demanding your value right off the bat. Sometimes you have to build up to it. But if you can prove what you do, that gives you skyrocket your credibility a lot more than knocking on so many doors. Especially if you do it for an organization that has credibility. You can kind of piggyback on their credibility. Mm -hmm. I, I have. <laughs> I think it works. <laughs> One other thing to add to that is a lot of our first contracts we got, they were just questions we were asking ourselves, like, how do I put solar panels on my home? So we started knocking on doors asking people that should know how to put solar panels on their houses, why we can't figure this out online, what it looks like, and together we all started to build this project. So sometimes your own curiosity can spark really great things in your field if you just reach out to people. And we live in Nova Scotia and everyone's friendly, and you should they pick up the phone if you offer them lunch. <laughs> Do we have any any questions? No? Yeah? No, sorry, you forgot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you have any final um, advice or uh, for for the audience uh, from your experience? Do you have like any snippet of kind of looking back from your journey, one thing you would like to leave us with? Uh, something you wish you knew or just something you learned? I think I was so excited to hear about this event personally because I found finding mentors that really add value for like very difficult, but once you find them, they can really change the game for you. So I was so happy to hear that you're hosting this event. And I think if you're looking to start a new idea, like find a community and stress test your ideas with them. Like it's great to bounce by friends and family, but you look if they're gonna tell you no to a job or yeah, you should do it, but it's not a good idea. So try to put yourself in the places that people will give you honest feedback, find mentorship with them, and always find good support when you're listening to new projects. I have a question for the video, actually. Yeah. As um, a young entrepreneur, i uh, recently self-employed. One of my biggest fears right now is not being taken seriously as a young woman in business. How do I overcome that? I used to work with that a lot as well, especially at first, but I feel like once you get more comfortable in these new situations, it just kind of comes to you. Like, you, you know you're working at the table, and it is just a mental challenge of accepting that as well. So, I mean, <coughs> if somebody really kind of feels <coughs> sure, like people are making you feel valued at the table, or is it just more of a, I have to. Yeah, I mean, it's the first thing. I mean you can call them out on it. <laughs> it's always an option, but it is a barrier, that is where it's nice to have a mentor as well to like come back from situations like that, feel like, hey, this happened to you today, and like feel like you'll get better in the future. Maybe we talk through some different ways to handle this when it happens again, so I can be taken more seriously. I just add to that, um, confidence is really key. You really have to believe in your own. Um, even when situations come up like that, you will very strong. Confidence is contagious. And people can sense it. The same thing, like there's a literal effect when someone walks in the room and they're confident, people can feel that, and there's this gravitational um, effect to that. So I would say that's definitely number one. A lot of times I find um, women sometimes cut themselves short because it, a lot of things start to, we're more sensitive to emotions, so you can kind of sense tension or resistance, and then if you, you let that get, get to you, um, it doesn't help the situation. The other thing, though, when you are in difficult situations where that happens a lot of times, um, finding internal champions is really helpful. I find so to your point of mentors, but also within a, like a if it's an organization you're trying to pitch to or a board meeting or something, finding one or two internal champions. 
some crowd, like a male already in a leadership role that they would expect or something. That's another way that you, if it's a really like um, toxic scenario or something where your the confidence isn't really helping you, um, finding champions can really help you. And to answer that's not even just a gender thing, that's just in general. Youth, I find when I was uh, serving this at 19, I found it was a double edge class ceiling. Um, women and youth, youth have just as much of a hard time with a lack of credibility and being taken seriously just as much. And so oftentimes, um, the strategy that I found is credibility. So the individuals you work with, um, the quality of your network, and finding in, um, internal champions that can vouch for you and really kind of help speak you up uh, to their colleagues, uh, or even just hold space for you in the room can really do a lot. So I would definitely recommend that if you've been in situations already and um, it can occur more often. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate it. Um, we will break. There's um, coffee and tea and some snacks. And um, talking about inclusion, we also have vegan and gluten free brownies for anyone. <laughs> so we have dietary and uh, food, food for all dietary needs. Um, and then after the break, uh, I, we have the Innovation Mastermind room. Uh, I can share with you the model that we've uh, developed to create these action plans and help you hopefully implement projects that you're working on or have an idea to work on, but it needs an action to move forward. So thank you.